sponsorship of visiting events here at Capital OTB. Gulfstream Park, the championship meet, running now through Florida Derby weekend, March 31st. Broadcasting live from the Capital OTB studios, this is Racing Across America with Seth Merrow. Good morning. Welcome to Racing Across America on this Saturday morning. I'm Seth Merrill. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let me remind you today here at the Clubhouse Racebook, $100 Trifecta Challenge. If you'd like to come down and enjoy the racing action here do so, and uh, maybe you'll get a little extra something with the Trifecta Challenge right here at the Racebook uh, today. Also, don't forget, Saturdays, we're open until 10 o'clock here at the Racebook. So come on down. That's going to work out good today because uh, the, the big race at the fairgrounds doesn't go off until about 7 o'clock. So come on down, grab a little dinner for Della's, and sit back and watch some of the racing action uh, tonight here at the Racebook, open until 10 p.m. All right, let's jump right into it. Taped a couple interviews yesterday. Joe Christofek from Fairgrounds. And Brendan Walsh, uh, he's got a couple of horses in uh, stakes races today at the fairgrounds. So we talked about that and more. A little bit later on, we'll be joined live. Take those two interviews yesterday. A little later on, we'll be joined live by John Piesek from the Maryland Horse Breeders. Uh, nice day down at Laurel today. General George, Barbara Fritchie, uh, and more stakes-wise. So we'll talk about that as well. But we'll jump in now. Uh, I just pulled up Joe, Joe Christovec's Twitter feed, and he just put out a few minutes ago. Um, sure enough, they were expecting some weather, and we talked about that a little bit in the interview. At this point, the second race and the eighth race are off the turf. Other races are on. Uh, so the Colonel Power is off the turf. As I said earlier, I had the same horse either way on top, just might, who can turf sprint or dirt sprint. So just might looks good either way. Um, but the second and the eighth at this point off the turf down at the fairgrounds, other races are on. So keep that in mind as you listen to uh, Joe Christovec. He's up next a little bit later on. Brendan Walsh, I'll come back on later for live. John Piasek to talk some Laurel also. But let's kick it off now. Fairgrounds, big day. Paddock commentator Joe Christovec up next. Fairgrounds Saturday. It seems like through the meet uh, about once a month, the big Saturdays highlighted by the three-year-old races, but a great undercard of stakes in various divisions and a great undercard of maiden specials and allowance runners and whatnot as well. And Saturday is one of those days. So who better to reach out to than our friend Joe Christofek? You see him in the pregame, the paddock commentary and more. Joe, good morning. Hey, good morning, Seth. How you doing? Very good. Uh, before we get going, we're taping on Friday, but it looks like uh, the potential for a little weather on Saturday. You have any update on that? Yeah. Um, the only entity that has an update on that is Mother Nature herself. <laughs> we were supposed to get rain all day Lecompte. I don't know if you remember that. We didn't really get any. So, you know, the forecast is, a you know, a little bit. I wouldn't even say dicey. I don't think we're going to get like heavy rains or anything, but there's a potential for some rain throughout the day. Um, I'm just hoping it doesn't affect, you know, the races coming off the turf. We might get something. We might get nothing. We might get, you know, something in between those two things. So really don't know. I'm, I'm just pushing forward as if it's going to be fast and firm or good on the turf. Yeah. When I looked at the forecast, it was just what you say. It looked like light maybe at various points throughout the day. So we'll keep our fingers crossed, as you say. And you and I were talking before we went on the air. I want a little update. Uh, how'd you make it through Mardi Gras? Um, and, uh, with Mardi Gras this week, you guys had racing on Monday and Tuesday. And I was watching one or the other of the days you guys were all costumed up, so it looked like a, it looked like a fun uh, Mardi Gras time down in uh, New Orleans at the fairgrounds. Oh yeah, Obi Wan Kaduli was his life <laughs> place paper. Uh, it was fun for sure. I'm not gonna lie, but the, I'm glad it's over. You've got uh, the carnival season, then you had Super Bowl, then you had Lundi Gras, Mardi Gras, where you're, you know, you're going out. People are coming into town, but you're also racing and then you have to prepare for a day like saturday 
which Louisiana Derby Day is what people consider our signature day, but I think this is our best yeah. day of racing of the year. So, you know, all that good stuff, you just got to learn to pace yourself and know what you can do and what you can't do and make sure, you know, my preparation and doing my job is my number, number one priority and then sprinkle in the rest of that stuff. But, yeah, it was fun. And whenever I have you on, I compliment you guys. You do a great job uh, with the prep work and with – uh, the way you put your shows together down at the fairgrounds and uh, other points of the year up at Churchill Downs as well. And that continues. You know, I'm in here doing the handicapping show in the afternoon, watching the various tracks, including the fairgrounds. And and you guys do a great job. So let's jump in and uh, take a look at the uh, very good Saturday card. We'll kind of work our way back from the highlight. Race number 14, uh, 617 scheduled post time your time it'll be 717 our time but the uh, risen star grade two event four hundred thousand dollars up for grabs mile and an eighth i'm going to take a little shot i was impressed i'm i'm going to buy into it the Tabor magner asmussen million dollar plus runner hall of fame who lived up to the name in the second career start we're going to take a look at that win back on january 20th it was a maiden race granted so gonna have to prove it but you know, they pay a million dollars in Name a Horse Hall of Fame. I think they had some expectations. We'll see if he absolutely lives up to it and validates the maiden win uh, on Saturday. Obviously, the horse to beat track phantom. I think Sierra Leone from Chad Brown is interesting. Hasn't been seen since the close-up second in the Remsen, but he's uh, coming to uh, fairgrounds and catching freedom for Brad Cox. Those attracted me. I could point to one or two others who also are intriguing, but what are your thoughts in the Risen Star? Yeah. I'll, I'll bang some quick thoughts out. So first on Hall of Fame, he actually ran faster than Gunrunner did on the undercard of the LeCompte. But, you know, he was he was really pressed in the service early. They really wanted to get that maiden win out of the way so they could move forward with a horse that they felt was a was a good prospect moving forward. Obviously, he's short on experience, and he's going to be facing a much tougher task. If he's going to win this race, that he's going to be he's going to have to be really good. Yeah, And uh, maybe he is. Like you said, he very well could be. Um, I don't see a lot of speed really in this race. I don't know what Cardinal is going to do for Todd Fletcher. The horse has shown speed, but now they're taking the blinkers off and they got Flavy on Pratt aboard. So that suggests to me maybe a change in strategy, with, which if there's not a lot, and you got B Dancer on the outside coming out of sprint, he's a little bit intriguing, but man, he's, he's you know marooned way out there. But I think he's going to show stretch out speed, although it's interesting because he's got Corey Lannery on him. And Corey's not a send rider either, so that could just fall into the lap of track random who's super legitimate. I don't know how much upside he has moving forward. You know, we had to work a little bit for that LeCompte win. His speed figures keep getting uh, incrementally better, and I think in big jumps, I know Steve was very happy with uh, the way he's progressed. But I think the most exciting prospect in the race is Sierra Leone, who you referenced uh, ran on the Remsen, in the Remsen, followed on the same path. Actually, as Zandon did uh, for Chad, and Zandon ran third in a good edition of the Risen Star a couple of years ago and then went on to run third in the Kentucky Derby. And that day at Aqueduct, and you guys know it way better than me, you follow it every day, was an extremely speed biased track. Seven of the ten winners went gate to wire, and the other three winners were right on the pace. And it was a weird result because it looked like Sierra Leone was going to run right past Dornock, but Dornock came back on him. I don't think Dornock was game. I just think Sierra Leone hung. Now you get the blinkers. Chad's been pointing at this race for months. Had a chance to talk to him on the phone the other day about it. And, uh, you know, he's using Tyler Gavillon more. He likes the possibility of using him not only in this race, but at Keeneland leading up to the Kentucky Derby if the horse proves himself to be that good. So I'm going to give Sierra, Sierra Leone a slight edge despite the apparent lack of speed in this race over uh, track phantom. But, like you said, there are several others in here that can run well. It's a tremendous addition to the race. Yeah, we didn't mention Anna Marie coming out of the win in the Kentucky Jockey Club. Uh, second in that race was Real Men Violin for Kenny McPeak. Um, it, this is a fun addition, 12 scheduled and uh, big names top and bottom. And uh, you would think this will produce a runner that will be very intriguing, going, or more than one runner, very intriguing going forward on the Derby Trail. All right, uh, amongst the girls, it's the Rachel Alexander, race number 13, $300,000, mile and a 16th. Uh, I'm going to pull up a replay of the Silver Bullet Day a little earlier in the meet. It'll be number six, West o Omaha, getting it done. 
I think West Omaha for this victory is the one to beat. But I'm going to go with Intricate. We're going to talk to Brendan Walsh and get his thoughts. Uh, this one, Intricate, hasn't been seen since the win in the Golden Rod. Uh, but now it takes a little break. These are the kind I think can come back improved. So I'm going to tilt in that direction over West Omaha. Vivi's dream uh, for Kenny McPeak, obviously very dangerous. Tarifa, uh, perfect shot. Again, another. There's only seven in here, but I think uh, a very nice, solid field in the Rachel Alexandra. Your thoughts? From what I'm hearing, there's only going to be six. I think okay. Brad is going to reroute West Omaha to the Honeybee at Oakland. Okay. And obviously she was a good a major contender. I think that camp is extremely uh, bullish and confident with Alpine Princess to outwork Catching Freedom uh, pretty easily uh, last week. And I know Catching Freedom, the deeper out the back clothes, are probably not a great workhorse, but Alpine Princess looked good doing it. And I don't know if she's going to make the lead here uh, based on post position five and panic drawn to her inside. I would guess that uh, Jared Loveberry, very sure they're going to game plan to try to go with panic. She's not without a chance either, man. I, I was really impressed with her, you know, maiden win here. It was in the slot, but I think she's capable of stretching out based on the pedigree, and I think she's going to make the lead. When I was said and done, though, for the public selection sets, I went to intricate over Vivi's dream. Again, two real exciting prospects. I think Vivi's dream was a little bit over the top when she ran in the rags, the riches up, the huge effort in the Alcibiades just three weeks earlier. She's been freshened up and pointing to this race. And Brendan Walsh has been pointing to this race since he won the Golden Rod with Intricate, who, you know, put forth a scintillating performance that day. The gallop out was huge. She looked like a serious prospect moving forward. Uh, the works have been good leading up to this. And, I'm going to give the edge to Intricate. You said it. There's only six in here with the likely defection of uh, West Sunset. But this is a very high-quality field. And we know from past years, pretty much of his last year, and many, many others, the Rachel Alexander winds up to be the most key feeder into the Kentucky Oaks with several horses that have won or exited this race winning it in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, fun. Very solid feel. Looking forward to that. Race number 12, we were talking before we went on the air, and, and I know you can't really get in depth, but we can talk about at least one of the horses and, and folks who watch you at Churchill and Fairgrounds. Now, or, or listen to my show. We talk about brilliant racing, your partnership all the time, and you kind of step back when you have a horse running. We have one tomorrow in the Fairgrounds. Uh $175,000 up for grabs a mile and eighth on the grass. I'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about this race as well with uh, Brendan Walsh. He has Rising Empire in here. But Brilliant Racing and Company, Johnny's Fireball for Norm Cassie, Ricardo Santana on board. And I know uh, you guys have been high on this one. Comes out of a fourth in the Diliberto. Uh, talk a little bit about Johnny's Fireball in the fairgrounds. I think we're going to run huge. I don't know if it's going to be good enough to win. I love the post. From the rail, I think if Ricardo gets aggressive, it can maybe put him, you know, in a pocket type situation. I think that would work to our benefit. We got too far back in the last race. If you watch it, we were the widest horse off the far turn, made a huge move, and kind of just leveled off a little bit uh, deep in the stretch. Horse trains like a, a beast of all the horses we've had ever uh, in our barn, uh, in our possession. Um, he's the most professional. He loves his job. He trains in the morning like a good horse uh, would train in the morning. Um, and, you know, we like Ricardo on him. Norm's had a lot of success with him. And uh, we like the potential trip we're going to get. So he's 10 to 1 in the morning line. And like I said, I, I'm very confident he's going to run well. Where that puts us versus the rest of the field, I don't know. Uh, full disclosure, Seth, we were trying to get in an optional claiming three other than for the better part of a week or two. And the race just wouldn't go. And this is kind of the backup plan. But, uh, you know, we can always get back to the three other then, or maybe we'll win the three other then in this race. But uh, we expect them to run well. We'll be rooting for you, certainly. You have to feel good off of that work uh, on the ninth. Bullet work, best of 65. So that's pretty solid coming into the race. Yeah, we're ready. We're about as ready as we're going to be. <laughs> uh, the Mine Shaft, also on the card uh, Saturday, a quarter of a million dollars, grade three event, mile and a 16th for the older performers. And I pulled up uh, – a replay um, going back to uh, um, just checking my notes here. Um, the uh, November 11th, the November 23rd race for uh, best actor. 
Uh, nice win there to uh, wind up the season. And for Brad Cox, uh, coming in as a couple of bullet workouts, end of January, beginning of uh, February. And this is a horse with some stakes performances underneath that were uh, pretty good, but since then has uh, gone into optional claimer uh, runs and put a couple of wins in September and the, the November start we watch. And uh, they could be nice little confidence builders. So I'm going to tilt towards best actor uh, in a, a prime spot, but I went with Smile Happy on top. I used him last time in the Louisiana, and he just didn't show up for Kenny McPeak. I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines today if he bounces back. So I'm taking a little shot off of that eh, dull performance last time. But I'm going to use Smile Happy over Best Actor. Red Route 1, uh, interesting to me, and Gasoline for Todd Pletcher. Your thoughts on the mind, Chef? Yeah, Smile Happy is the biggest question mark in any of these stakes. They could go either way because he's such a whack job. Yeah. And Kenny McPeak said, you know, <laughs> First, he loved him going into the race, and then after the race, he said he needed the race. So you know how that goes. Yeah. Um, but he brought the horse back to his training center in Florida uh, after the Louisiana, basically saying he likes training there. And then he comes here and he gets here the week, week of the race, and now he's going to run. You know, He's not going to be facing Saudi Crown, and that's going to help him. Yeah. But he's got a tough outside post, and you just don't know what this horse is going to give you that race was so bad last time, Seth. He, maybe he needed the race. I I don't know, but man, he's going to have to run a lot better than that. I I I'm going to go with the horse that you mentioned uh, at the top as a preview for this race, and that's the best actor. I know he's been running one turn races recently, but he's got salmon on the damn side of the pedigree. There's not a lot of speed in here. Uh, the kind of horse that you know when they get a little bit older for Brad that, you know, just develops a little bit later than some of the other ones. He really pushes his good horses to try to be good three-year-olds and be derby and triple crown type horses. And uh, this one didn't wind up being that, but he's wound up being good. Kind of sort of like West willpower. If you remember him, he got to be a little bit better, a lot better actually yeah. later on in his career. So best actor for me, I think he can be the controlling speed in a race that doesn't have a lot of it. Uh, again, interesting uh, stakes race on the card, as is the uh, Stahl Memorial, 10th uh, race on the card on Saturday, $100,000. Philly and Mayers going uh, scheduled a mile and 16th on the grass. I pulled up uh, a replay here of um, Not So Close, and I went back to, yeah, I got to do it, I'm a homer. I went back to Saratoga back in the middle of August. That was a couple starts back for Not So Close. Followed that up in October, Keeneland running fourth. But with the early speed, I think the Mary Lou Whitney stable, Norm Cassie trained not so close, might be able to steal it. Comes in with a nice bullet workout, 59-2. and two. I'm going to tilt towards him, but creative Cairo coming out of the wind and the cramps is certainly uh, very, very dangerous. On the outside, join the dance, I think, also dangerous. The second ran second in the cramps. What are your thoughts on the Stahl Memorial? Yeah, I think you got to really pay attention to the scratches here because Joe Sharp's got Dana's beauty in the race, and then you've got that Sinatra horse in the race, and they're the kind of horses that can mess things up for not so close, but they also don't really belong in the field. So I wouldn't be surprised if one or both of them scratch. If they both stay in, it's going to make uh, not so close as uh, test that much tougher one horse I'm interested in, Seth, and I know you mentioned Creative Cairo, and that horse was visually impressive last time. He's going to pick up six pounds off of that win. And uh, Join the Dance is just an average kind of optional claiming allowance horse. Allowance horse. Lovely Princess, I think, is uh, you know headed in the wrong direction. You notice she's not back in this race, so she did run her best that day. I'm going to go with Watch This Birdie on top. This is going to be a price play for me. She's ultra consistent. She ran third in the pay go hop behind Trufani. And had a terrible trip that day. And she always seems to display resiliency. She's got a late kick. I really like the rail draw for her. I see the potential for some early speed. And, you know, most importantly for me, I see the potential for 8, 10, 12 to 1 as she gets lost, lost in the shuffle with uh, several of these others. So on top selection for me publicly will be watch this birdie. But again, I looked at this race for a long time before settling on a top pick. Uh, another one of those races where there's several different ways you can go. I like it, and I can I agree. I could see that one floating up a couple points too. James Graham's on board, and he's got uh, a nice meet under his belt so far. So I like it. Uh, 
And finally, on the stake section, the Colonel Power, five and a half, schedule five and a half on the turf. Um, I've liked Just Might. I like Just Might in the Kenner. It wound up to be Sasua Summer. We're going to watch the stretch run to the Kenner uh, back on January 20th. The three will be Sasua Summer. The one will be Just Might. Just gets caught by Sasua Summer, the Bill Mott runner, who comes back again. But I'm going to look to flip them up uh, and put Just Might on top. Uh, a lot of times I try that, and they come back just the same way. We'll see how it works. I think charging is interesting. Minnesota ready for uh, Tommy Amos, interesting as well. Your thoughts on the Colonel Power? Yeah, this race is uh, more competitive, at least on paper, than the uh, the canner where it looked like Just Might was going to get loose, and he kind of did. But, you know, it's that Luis Saez factor. He can read the form, and he puts the Sua Summer in the race, and it wound up being the difference uh, by a nose. I thought Just Might won the race, but uh, Sasua Summer got his nose down. He's picking up six pounds off of that win. And Just Might, you know, most likely, maybe to his benefit, is probably going to track charging here. His charging has been on the lead in each of his last four starts. Doesn't have a class with some of the others, but it changes the complexion of the race for Just Might, which could work in his favor. Minnesota Ready, I think, is going to have, you know, a more contested pace to run at. In here, he was purchased for 380000 out of that Wilson box dispersal, Tom Amos, the new trainer, gets a great turf sprint rider in Joel Rosario. So that horse is interesting. But when all is said and done, yes, I went the silent poet on top. The nine-year-old, who's a, a, a grade one winner in Canada, made a million dollars, and he hasn't raced since Golden Gate, Del Mar, this past summer and fall. And I just think this horse is here for a reason. He's under Tanner Tracy. He's had a couple of works over the main track, and everybody's going to gravitate to the horses we talked about already. The Sua Summer, Just Might, Minnesota Ready, and some of the others, because they're familiar with those horses, could allow us to get maybe 8-1 to one on a horse that's a grade one winner in his career and seems to be very well intended from the rail. So, gave the edge a silent poet, but uh, again, great betting race potentially. Just got to hope the storm stay away and uh, we get a fair playing course and uh, take it from there. Yeah, looking forward to a great stakes card. But, again, on these big days, also a lot of fun on the undercard. And so I have to let you talk. Uh, again, we mentioned uh, we, we were talking before we went on the air. You said you had one in one of the maiden special undercard races, the seventh race. Again, brilliant racing and company. Trainer Greg Foley, you have Diamond Lord, first-time starter. What are you expecting in the debut? Oh, well, the plan for the debut was not to throw this horse to the wolves, I'll tell you that. <laughs> this you know, we're going to get a gauge on what we got here, Seth, because there's some potential monsters. He is uh, Dwight Abario's half-brother, um, and he trains well. He's just a little bit headstrong, a little bit green, and he needs the racing experience like most of the Greg Foley, you know, young horses do. Greg's had a great meet with uh, some of his younger horses, and he's got several in our division, the male sprint division, and uh, we were a little bit behind some of the other ones in his barn that have performed well. So just would like to see this horse show something, whether it's a speed and fade, whether it's a picking off horses late, whether, you know, just showing some professionalism against a good field and kind of take it from there. So he might shock us and win. I just hope that uh, he represents well and uh, looking forward to finally getting him to the races. That's going to be fun. I always like to root for your horses, so we got a couple of root for uh, tomorrow, Diamond Lord in the seventh and in the fairgrounds, Johnny's Fireball. And I have to ask, I, I asked you uh, the last time I had you on, we were talking the brilliant racing horses, and I'll see if I get the pronunciation right. Dual Guru? And I, I mentioned that one because uh, I did notice there was a nice uh, second best of 43 workout just about a week ago. For that one. So will we see Dual Guru at uh, some point before the meet ends? Mm, yes. So hopefully, <laughs> I think maybe another work or two and you should be ready. He's a Louisiana bred, so you don't have to be that great to uh, uh, be competitive in the maiden special eight races. And I think he's probably going to want to go long, might want to run on turf. Uh, he's been training fine. There was a stable mate that got the bullet that day, and uh, we were second best behind the stable mate, but. It was his first work from the gate, and uh, he's progressing. We should have several horses running in the next uh, few weeks and months as uh, we had a little bit of a lull there um, with our with our regular action for, for the stable. But, uh, yeah, looking forward to debuting him and, you know, getting rolling again with uh, some regular races uh, for, bro for Brilliant. Did I pronounce it right this time, Dual Guru? Yeah, you nice. did. Okay, Dual Guru, no, yeah. I didn't have... 
The horse is named for John Dooley. Yeah. There's a horse that used to run around here called Rougarou, so we just named it Dooligarou, uh, <laughs> with the with the Cajun uh, spelling and pronunciation. And I know Dooley himself is a very excited uh, to see this horse run eventually and get to call him. So <laughs> hopefully he's not calling him, fading him, fading through the field. <laughs> All right, looking forward to that as well, Joe. Always appreciate the, the time and the conversation. Wish you and everybody uh, a fun Saturday down at the fairgrounds. We'll be watching, and we will talk again. All right. Sounds good, Seth. Have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Good luck. Joe Christovec from the fairgrounds. Again, a big Saturday on tap. Thanks, Joe. That was great. And they're off in the Pegasus World Cup. They're off in the Fountain of Youth stage. And they're off in the Curlin Florida Derby. 4K wins. White of Oreo almost home. And Nyquist is still unbeaten. Orb and John Velasquez have won the Florida Derby. Florida wins. And there you have it. Northern Dancer will be the winner of the Florida Derby. Sometimes it pays to go with the flow, to check your worries at the door, to reconnect with your crew, to follow the thrills and the flavor, to roll with it and see where it takes you, to enjoy every minute to its fullest, and to dance like there's no tomorrow. You can do that here at Rivers Casino and Resorts Connectedy, where the good times flow. Welcome back. Happy to be joined now by trainer Brendan Walsh. He's got a couple in stakes uh, at the fairgrounds on Saturday, a pig stakes card at the fairgrounds. Also want to talk about a nice winner he had over at Gulfstream a couple of weeks ago. Brendan, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How are you? Very good. Happy to have you on board, particularly to talk about the first race we're going to take a look at, um, and that is the uh, Rachel Alexandra at the fairgrounds. Fairgrounds has a nice series of races for the three-year-old fillies heading a little bit later on, hopefully the Kentucky Oaks. Uh, the Rachel Alexandra is one of those, $300,000 up for grabs, mile in a 16th. And you have Intricate in there. And I'm going to pull up a replay from the Goldenrod. Intricate is going to be the number two horse here. And get it done pretty nicely, pretty easily. 85 buyer, November of the two-year-old season, a solid number. Talk a little bit about the two-year-old season for Intricate, Intricate and this uh, win in the Goldenrod. Yeah, well, we, we started her out at, um, at, uh, at Churchill um in the september meeting she ran uh she ran quite well she was only beaten a couple of lengths uh galloped out huge we stretched her out at keeneland uh in a good maiden there and she won uh there pretty easy and then we took a shot at the golden rod and and again she uh she won pretty impressively there too so she hasn't done too much wrong um so far she's been been working very well um in the in the interim, and uh, you know, I've, we've got her pretty ready for tomorrow. Uh, and again, a nice progression in numbers. Are you a numbers guy, a buyer's guy? Because as you say, at a fifty-nine in the debut, but then followed up with the maiden break or seventy-two, then an eighty-five, moving moving from a maiden special weight to a grade two. That was impressive. So the numbers have moved forward nicely in those first three starts as a two-year-old. Yeah, no, for sure. It's always. Uh, it's always nice to see the, the numbers um, confirming uh, what you think. Um, you know, so yeah, her numbers are good. Listen, she's, she's done very well. Numbers aside, she's, she's been impressive with what she's done so far. And, uh, you know, we, we feel she's done well over the, over the winter and, uh, you know, she should, she should be coming in to tomorrow with a, in pretty good shape. Uh, Paid uh, over a quarter of a million dollars for at Ocala April last year as a two-year-old. Were you in on the purchase at the two-year-old sale, and what attracted you and the team to her? 
No, unfortunately, I, I can't take credit for that. Um, <laughs> uh, said Pete Bradley bought her, uh, Pete's uh, bloodstock agent in Lexington, and he also retains an interest in, in uh, the horses that he buys and has a very, very good eye for a horse. He's, he's very well known uh, through the years. Um, but yeah, Pete bought her and, and sent her to me, um, you know, but she's uh, she's a lovely filly, really, really nice, uh, typical candy right gun runner type, um, you know, uh, not over big, but she's she's big enough and she's good enough. So, uh, but well put together, has a great mind and, uh, you know, all the qualities you look for in a, in a good one. And gun runner has been so impressive as a sire. Do those horses come to you with something special? Um, yeah, I mean, she, you know, she, she was working okay as a two year old. Um, you know, we, we thought she was okay, um, without, without being a, a superstar, but she's made a very good progression, um, Seth, and she's working, uh, better now than what she ever worked as a, as a two year old, um, to be honest. I, I when I do the handicapping show in the afternoon, I look at horses like this, and I always say lightly race two year olds, even lightly race three year olds. But sometimes they get a few months off, and they come back improved. They mature and come back improved. Do you see that as the potential uh, on Saturday for Intricate? Absolutely, yeah. She she's done. She, like I said, she's been working better this year than what she did as a two year old. Um, you know, she's gotten stronger physically as well. Um, and like I said, she's got a great mind too. So I'm really looking forward to what she does tomorrow. So hopefully she can confirm what we've been thinking. And I'm curious, the nuts and bolts on the trainer and owner side of things. Um, obviously, the first three starts, as I say, the maiden race uh, ran fifth in there, then breaks the maiden nicely in the second start. You go right to a grade two, the goldenrod, and she wins that very impressively. So you know you have the potential on your hands. What is the decision process, you and the team, because she's been working, she's been based, obviously, at fairgrounds, and how long has this race, the Rachel Alexander, been on your radar, and how do you decide coming out of the two-year-old season how the three-year-old season will unfold? Well, I think, um, you know, that we, we took a very similar pattern to what we did last year with, um, with Pretty Mischievous, you know, and it worked very well last year. You know, and I, you know, we've entered a few nice three-year-olds now down in in New Orleans, and and it's worked well for them. I think they do a good, they have a good program down there. The track is very good. So we, you know, basically with Intricate, we we followed a very similar path to what we did with Privy. Um, you know, Intricate was obviously a Grade Two winner going into the the winter, whereas Pretty wasn't, and we won a stake with Pretty in uh, at Christmas last year. Um, but you know, I think hopefully Intricate will follow a very similar um, preparation to to Pretty for going forward from here, and, and hopefully to the Oaks after this. Give me your expectations on Saturday. I think she'll run a nice race. I haven't cranked her up to the hill. Um, I think there's still a little improvement in her. You know, we backed off of her after the Golden Rod and, and gave her you know an easy thirty days, and then then ramped her back up, but I haven't, uh, you know, we haven't got the screws totally tight, but I still expect her, by the way she's been working, I still expect her to run, uh, you know, to to a very high level, and, and I think it'll be good enough, and I guess we'll find out. Yeah, interesting race for sure, and she looks good. I, I put her on top, and I'm looking forward to seeing a return. Tyler Gaffley on schedule to ride again. Um, so we wish you a lot of good luck there in the Rachel Alexander, but also in the fairgrounds on the undercard. Uh, in the fairground stakes, that is, you have Rising Empire. We're going to take a look at the uh, Colonel Bradley from January 20th. Going to run third in here behind a couple others coming back. Strong quality, uh, wins the race, number two, number nine, beatbox runs second. Rising Empire runs third. Luis Saez was on board that day, scheduled to be back on board on Saturday. Give us your thoughts uh, for Saturday for Rising Empire. He, he loved it at the fairgrounds, um, that he always, uh, you know, he, he seems to like that track a lot. He ran a couple of really nice races on it last year. Um, as he's done this year, the last day he missed the break a little and, and it kind of compromised us, um, a bit considering that the, the horse that won, the horse of Cassie's was on a front runner and he was on the lead the whole way around. Um, but, you know, Rising Empire is one of these horses that, 
you know, he, he pretty much always shows up, especially at the fairgrounds. And I'm sure if if the pieces came together for him, he can win one of these races along the way. You know? He was right in the mix uh, uh, in, in the uh, the Colonel Bradley. Got off to a little bit of a slow start there, but uh, as I say, he was right in the mix. Now there's a, a potential for a little bit of rain. It sounds like it's going to be okay, but if uh, if it worked out, would you still stick on the dirt because he does have some dirt for him? Yeah, no, he um, he he was quite a useful um, a useful horse. He broke his uh, his maiden and won his. Uh, his first level allowance on the dirt, to, excuse me, at the fairground. So I think if uh, if it did come down to it, we'd probably go ahead and, uh, and run him on the dirt as well if, if we had to. But, you know, obviously we'd rather go to the grass if we can. Yeah, and as I say, the forecast looks like the potential is there, but it seems like it's probably going to work out all right. Uh, all right, so we wish yeah. you a lot of good luck on Saturday. The, oh, before I move on from the fairgrounds, you had one uh, on the undercard as well, race two an allowance event yet verbal interesting uh, scheduled for the turf at the fairgrounds on Saturday, but comes off a couple of seconds up at Turfway. Uh, what are you looking for, for verbal on the undercard? Yeah, he, he's a, he's a useful horse. Um, you know, we, we feel that he can, he can win this, uh, this two X at some point. Um, you know, uh, he's probably a little better on grass than he is on poly. Um, set. So, you know, his horse will, will pay, play some around and, and hopefully he can win the two weeks and maybe keep improving to be a, a useful horse through the year. And that also shows, again, I always like to talk the nuts and the bolts with the trainers. How many condition books do you have to go through uh, on a daily or a weekly basis? And when you have a, a stable like you do at different at tracks and you're kind of looking and you, you find a, a spot like this for verbal, you're up at the turf way and you look and say, hey, you know what? He might work out on the grass down at the fairgrounds. Like I say, how are you looking at the condition books on a daily or a weekly basis? Well, the nice thing is, you you know, you're kind of, we've, we've got a horse wherever we are, you're kind of watching it the whole time. Yeah. So. Um, you know, this race came up for him. He's got a nice purse on it, and, and we just thought, well, if he got in, uh, you know, why not? Um, you know, the turf track's been very good at the fairgrounds this year, and uh, again, he, he he's the type of horse he's probably a little better on on the grass than he is on uh, on anything else. So uh, hopefully, we get to run him on it tomorrow, and uh, he should be there thereabouts. So, again, we wish you a lot of good luck Saturday at the fairgrounds, but I wanted to go back a couple of weeks because people who watch me know uh, I regularly say my favorite little subdivision is the three-year-olds uh, on the turf because you get stakes races at almost every track throughout the year. starts early in the year and goes to the end of the year, and we're in the early portion of the year, and so this, this is the time where I like to – look and kind of pick out the three-year-olds on the turf to watch up here at Saratoga. We, of course, have the Hall of Fame every year for the three-year-olds and more. But a couple of weeks ago down at Gulfstream, the Kitten's Joy, uh, you had uh, number six, First World War, who had already shown some nice ability. Four starts, a win, and a couple of seconds. One of those seconds had been in a dirt stakes race, the Mucho Macho Man, but you popped him back to the turf a couple of weeks ago in First World War. Nice winner in the Kitten's Joy. Talk a little bit about the performance there. And now what do you do going forward with a three-year-old who has shown some ability on turf and dirt? Yeah, well, we've always liked him um, on the turf anyway. Set. You know, we started him, obviously, um, on the turf and, and, and then took him to Keeneland. And he ran a very good race in the Bourbon. He's going to beat the length and a half. Um, you know, we put him on the dirt for obvious reasons. He always worked good on the dirt. Uh, plenty. I actually trained his, his uh, dam Sundays at the beach, and she was a useful uh, filly on the dirt as well. So, you know, for obvious reasons, we tried him on it. Um, probably does have a little bit of a stamina limitation on the dirt. Um, you know, so we, we decided. And I think he's he's a better horse on grass anyway. Um, I think he showed that the last day. So we decided to put him back on the turf. And uh, that's probably where he's going to stay right now for the for the time being anyway. But uh, I think we'll probably take a look at the, you know, the remaining stakes at Gulfstream or possibly the Transylvania team. Uh, and do you agree with me as a trainer? Uh, you find it fun to have a nice three-year-old on the turf? Because as I say, it seems like all year long there are nice stakes races around the country. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the, you know, we, we always uh, we always uh, like to have a good horse on any sort of set. <laughs> They're always welcome. But um, but yeah, no, look, we've had had plenty of luck with these these nice turf types the last few years. So uh, you know, we, we like this horse a lot, and and. Um, Hopefully he can go on and do bigger and better things as the year goes along. And I must uh, say and congratulate you and, and get your reaction because uh, from when I first got in the game, a little bit different. You debuted the middle of September at Kentucky Downs, uh, and he wins the career debut, maiden special rate, maiden special weight race, one hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars to kick the career off. Not bad. No, not bad at all. Um, <laughs> you know he. he I think he's uh, he's over a quarter of a million one right now. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's great to uh, you know the prize money system, especially in Kentucky, is, is particularly good. So, yeah. um, like I said, a good one is is welcome, no matter what the surface. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and again, uh, Brendan, we wish you a lot of good luck uh, on Saturday. Looking forward to Intricate uh, stepping along the three-year-old Philly trail in uh, her three-year-old uh, debut. I know uh, you guys are always busy, so we appreciate the time. Good luck on the afternoon. We'll talk again down the road. Thank you very much. Seth. Good talking to you. You too. Brendan Walsh, again, a couple of stakes runners at the fairgrounds on Saturday, one on the undercard, and the nice little three-year-old on the turf to watch going forward. First World War. Haven't signed up for a Capital OTB account yet? Now's the time to take advantage of the sign-up bonus. Open up a new account with $200 or more, bet $400 by the end of the month, and receive a bonus $200 into your account. Plus, you can take advantage of everything an OTB account has to offer. Wagering from any device, live streaming, racing info, past performances, online promotions, and more. Sign up today and take advantage of the new account bonus. Details at CapitalOTB.com. Come on. I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Uh, my bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Capital OTV is now streaming live on Roku. The RTN Racing Channel on Roku lets you watch OTB TV live through your Roku device or your Amazon Fire Stick, rather than being limited to computers and mobile devices, which means you can now watch OTB live wherever you are. Simply open Roku, scroll to find the RTN channel, then click on OTB TV. OTB TV on Roku. Try it now. Welcome back to Racing Across America. Again, big stakes day coming up at uh, Fairgrounds. Happy to be joined earlier, and thanks for uh, taking the time, Joe Christofek and Brendan Walsh. But there's also a big stakes day down at Laurel today, General George, uh, the Barbara Fritchie, a couple more stakes as well. So we reached out to our friend John Piasek from the Maryland Horse Breeders Association. He's the communications director. He'll give us some ideas. You can also catch John's work at theracingbiz.com. Uh, the good work from our friend Frank Vespi over there. John, good morning. Good morning, Seth. How you doing? Very good. And before we start, uh, I want to tout again because I looked at your Twitter feed. I always do for guests. And so you, you were back in the booth doing a little guest announcing at Rosecroft. And it was a couple of months ago I tweeted to you. It was a funny cancellation day. And normally I, when I'm in doing the afternoon handicapping show, we wouldn't necessarily show freehold. But there was some weather cancellations. And we had freehold. And I'm sitting in here. To, I said, wait a minute. Is that an announcement? And sure enough, you were there. And I tweeted, said, nice job at freehold. So a little freehold, a little uh, Rosecroft the other day. Uh, I have to ask, have, uh, uh, have you ever announced on the thoroughbred side of things? Uh, once, um, when I was 18, uh, is when Larry Coleman left Mama's Park and the job was open and I figured, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll send in a demo and I, and I'll make a shot. And I did. And while of course they didn't hire me, they were so impressed that I, um, applied. They had me as a guest announcer as a race. And so that was the first time I got to call any kind of paramutual race live. I haven't called a thoroughbred race since, but I've done 
plenty of harness work at Freehold and Rosecroft and, and also at a Hagger Downs. It's great. I mean, I have so much fun doing it. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, very good. And as I said, uh, when I heard you, nice job. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, thank you. If, if, if folks out there hear a familiar voice, it could be uh, John Piasek in the booth. Uh, but today, <laughs> we're going to take advantage of uh, some handicapping skills. Uh, and you touted me to, to check some of the scratches. And I will note uh, there is a, a big scratch in the, uh, the Barbara Fritchie. Uh, with Intrepid Daydream from Safi Joseph going out. And uh, I will tell the guys in the control room, I had called for an Intrepid Daydream replay. They can scratch that one off of their playlist. But we'll get to the Barbara Fritchie in a moment. We'll start things out with the General George Grade 3 event, uh, $200,000 up for grabs, seven furlongs uh, the trip. Cowan is scratched out of this one. But I pulled up a replay of the horse that I think everybody will be on. And just it's one of those races where you sit back and you just enjoy the, the performance. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of money to be had necessarily. But we're going to take a look here at the Jennings from uh, January 28th. The number eight horse is going to be post time. Going out for Brittany Second Russell, last, the high the percentage trainer down there in the Maryland area. And this one is six for seven coming into this afternoon, including this victory in the Jennings. It looks like uh, post time is in a good spot again this afternoon. That said, Nimitz class from George Weaver, I think adds some interest. Comes out of a poor performance in the Pegasus, but has a nice record himself at Laurel. So I think it sets it up to be a fun race. Uh, post time, as I say, will take a lot of action, but Nimitz class makes it interesting. What did you see in the general, George? I think post time on top, as you see in, in the replay, he was extremely impressive in the Jennings. I mean, Sheldon really never asked him to run. Once he got clear at the top of the stretch, he just kind of nudged him, never had to give him the whip, and he won as much the best. On the business scale that day, he ran a 104, I believe a 103 on the buyer scale. And those numbers were not far off from what National Treasure earned the day before in the Pegasus. Yeah, so close time clearly has a ton of upside. He loves his track. He has a powerful closing kick. He had a good recent workout at Lowell on Sunday, a bullet four furlong drill in 48 and one. I think that's what um, inspired Brennan to take a shot here. Seven furlongs looks right in his wheelhouse. And I'll tell you what, I know a lot of folks bought um, Belmont Stakes tickets up, up in your neck of the woods uh, this week. Would not be a surprise if this guy showed up in the undercard um, in the Met Mile. And it's just, as I say, Brittany Russell with a, uh, a solid performer, and it's going to be fun to see if he can keep that win streak going. And, and again, adding to the fun is Nimitz class, I think. It, so post time doesn't necessarily tower over this bunch because I think Nimitz class brings some uh, performances at Laurel, won the John Campbell uh, last year, uh, for instance. So it's a fun race. The uh, General George the ninth this afternoon. Uh, the aforementioned Barbara Fritchie is just prior to that race number eight today, grade three event for the ladies uh, going seven furlongs, $200,000 purse. Uh, I pulled up uh, a replay. Um, oh, I, I had that intrepid daydream replay, so we won't see a replay. Uh, but I think Prodigy Dow, uh, I'll mention that one as a potential long shot I found interesting from uh Phil Schoenthal comes off a win last time. I think has to step it up, but a 20 to one on the morning line. I thought that one was intriguing. Bluefeld comes in for Safi, as did Intrepid Day, Day, Daydream, but that one now scratches. So Bluefeld becomes a little more interesting. An apple picker for Brittany Russell and Mike Dubb uh, coming in off a couple of nice stakes performances most recently. Also intriguing for me. But what did you see in the Barbara Fritchie? I picked Bluefield on top, however, if I think you're onto something with um, Barty Doll, I picked her originally third, moved up to second when Intrepid Daydream was scratched. I thought she ran uh, really well last time out. It, it, it was a second start off about a six-month layoff, and she was running against what I thought was a biased track. That weekend at Laurel, horses who were racing on the lead and on the rail had a big advantage. Barty Doll came on the outside part of the track and still showed plenty of late punch, one by four and a half lengths going away, improves to an 88 on the business scale, um, not far off from her peak form in the 90s, which she was running at about this time last year. As you said, I think she has to take a little bit of, of a step forward to win this race, but if she does, she'll be pretty interesting. Uh, as I mentioned, I did pick Blue Thought on top. She's in improving form. I thought we ran pretty well in the inside information to start that. Uh, took a little while to get clear, and when she did, uh, ran on pretty well in the stretch, chased Olivia Darling, 
and ended up second. She's a pretty steady story. Once she got back, um, racing on a more steady basis in the fall, her figures improved. Jamie Rodriguez, one of the top local jockeys, picks up the mount. Thinks she'll also show a pretty good late kick. All right, now I'm interested if we'll get that 20 to 1 on Prodigy Dell since we're, we both kind of <laughs> like that one off the last effort. But I'm going to certainly take a look uh, in the Barbara Fritchie. A little bit earlier on the card, the Nellie Morse, $100,000 up for grabs for the Phillies and Mayors, going a mile and a 16th. And this one, uh, I do have a replay. I pulled up a replay from the Jamie Ness runner, uh, Charming Way, back on February 2nd. Going to be the eight horse in here and win that very nicely. Optional claimer, so steps up a little bit. But I thought uh, the way this horse has run the last three, won the last three, three race win streak, and off of the, the last couple of efforts, certainly I think is going to fit in here. Um, so Charming Way is interesting. Another one at a price I think is intriguing. 30 to 1 on the morning line. New hire. Comes over from Penn National off a win. Another one that probably has to step it up, but I thought intriguing. Another uh, one that certainly from Brittany Russell will take plenty of action is Hybrid Eclipse coming off some nice stakes efforts at Laurel 4. Obviously, Brittany Russell taking action there as well. But uh, how did you th see things shaking out in the Nellie Morse? Well, Hybrid, um, hybrid um, Eclipse, of course, loves this track. She's 7 for 12 on it, won this race last year. We had a solid second last time out behind Saddle Up Jesse, who, of course, came back to win the Heavenly Prize last Saturday. Certainly no shame in that. I think Charming Way, a little up-and-coming Maryland Red Mare by an up-and-coming Maryland Stallion, um, Lofeld. Looks like a main speed in here. Ran well, while wide on the pace last time out, made her way over to the rail and the lead. Uh, time hit the turn, and as you saw, kicked away nicely. A top pick um, is number six, Frosty O'Toole for Michael Dini and J. Ron Harbosa coming up from Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, made his second start off a brief layoff last time out and was forced to close off a pretty slow pace in an opening quarter of 25 seconds flat, opening half in 51. It can be hard to overhaul a leader chasing those kind of fractions. But Frosty O'Toole did so, and one going away, I thought his figure was, was a little bit uh, pace compromised that day, should improve it, um, if she gets an honest pace to run into. I think Charming Way is going to set the pace. New hire, who you mentioned, could apply some light pressure, as might hashtag lucky from the outside. So, so, so if the pace is fast enough, it'll set up nicely for Frosty O'Toole. I I'm glad you mentioned Frosty O'Toole because my man down at Tampa is Mike Dini. I always like the Mike Dini horses. And then he elects to come up from Tampa with this one. And Frosty O'Toole probably is worth a, a closer look. All right, uh, kicking off the stakes action will be race number six, the John Campbell, $100,000 up for grabs, a mile and an eighth. I'm going to look for the veteran to go back to back. I pulled up a replay from January 27th. The number 10 horse will be Yodali A. Hu uh, going out for a Jamie Ness. And again, went over to Laurel to, to get this victory we're watching right now. Obviously, a lot of action will be sent towards the Rapoli runner for Brittany Russell. Brittany Russell... Uh, given her performance over the past couple of years, attracting owners like Michael Dubb and Mike Rapoli and Be Better, one of those. And this one comes in off a series of pretty good stakes efforts and, uh, as I say, probably takes some action. What did you see in the John Campbell? I think the horse to watch out of that January 27th race actually is um, Bertini Martin, who, who's number four in this race. Your Lee A, who I thought took advantage of that rail bias track, as you can see, he came up the inside to win. Bertini Martin, though, uh, was racing on the more dis uh, disadvantageous part of the track, and Stoke Post well got up the third. He's a bit of an, uh, of an interesting long shot. My top pick in here, though, ended up being number nine, Bob Marco, a $20,000 claim last June for Kieran McGee. He's now won four in a row, and he's really made an impression on the circuit because he likes to go out to very long early leads and just never look back. Last time out, he was up by eight at three-quarter pole and one by nine and a quarter. Two stars back, he was up by 18 lengths up the back stretch and won by eight and a quarter. He's owned some huge figures in his last few starts. And yes, it's a step up in class here. Um, the other thing, though, is, is there's really no speed to go with him. Like, I don't think anybody else can run with him early on. And I'm not sure if, if anyone's good enough to close if he gets away with, say, a 48-second half mile. I think he'll just be too loose to catch. But, you know, Rojas keeps the mount. He knows this horse very well. As long as he breaks, he'll go straight to the front do his usual thing, and from there, I don't think he'll be reeled in. Yeah, uh, that speed from the outside, uh, intriguing, certainly. Uh, fun little stakes card at Laurel this afternoon. What, what's your weather look like? 
We had some snow overnight. Snow from about 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. Overall, got about two or three inches. Training was canceled this morning, actually, to allow track superintendent uh, Ken Brown and his team to work on the track. They did a great job. Track is currently labeled good. I saw some pictures this morning. Looks like it's in great shape and will be ready to go for a great stakes pack day of action. Looking forward to it. Uh, again, a uh, couple of favorite stakes every year for people like the General George, the John Campbell, and certainly the Barbara Fritchie on the card today at Laurel. John Piesek from the Maryland Horse Breeders Association. Thanks for joining us. And again, I just pulled up the verify and sure enough, as I said, you do work for uh, the racing biz and you've handicapped the entire mm -hmm. card over on the racingbiz.com. People can check that out as well, but we appreciate the visit this morning. We'll talk again. Sounds good, Seth. Take care. Appreciate it. All right. Big day at uh, Laurel as well as that big day at the fairgrounds. Some fun action coming up this afternoon. I'll be looking at all of it on OTB Live for a Saturday afternoon. Um, we'll also have some aqueduct in the mix, obviously. They have a couple of nice stakes uh, today as well and plenty more action here on the network also. We'll kick it off in probably about an hour or so for OTB Live for a Saturday afternoon. Um Aqueduct kicks off at 12.20 today. Again, in the wintertime, they kind of fluctuate around, uh, but it's a 12.20 post time at Aqueduct, so keep that in mind for New York racing today. But as I say, we will have plenty of action to take a look at. And don't forget, if you'd like to come down here and join us at the Clubhouse Racebook today, we would love to have you. Go grab a little lunch at Fredella's, but more, more importantly, play the uh, $100 Trifecta Challenge. You can win a little extra something here at the Clubhouse Racebook this afternoon with the uh, promotion that happens today. And don't forget, on Saturdays, we're open until 10 p.m. here at the Clubhouse Racebook. And today, with the feature at the fairgrounds going off at right around 7 o'clock, uh, that's a good uh, time to maybe come down, come down a little earlier and grab a little dinner at Fredella's, and then kick back and watch that uh, feature race, the three-year-old square off down to the fairgrounds and hang around for some racing action. Clubhouse Racebook open until 10 p.m. on this Saturday. All right, Seth Merrill in the studio, going to wrap it up for Saturday uh, morning, uh, leading into what looks like a really fun Saturday afternoon. So we certainly want you to stay tuned for all of it. As I say, I'll be back in about an hour or so for OTV Live on a Saturday afternoon. We'll see you then. We'd like to thank Gulfstream Park for their sponsorship of this program and some of the other programming and events here at Capital OTB. Gulfstream Park, the championship meet, running now through Florida Derby weekend, March 31st. You're watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.